Thank you. Hi. I'm the last speaker. Everybody's looking at their watch and thinking about dinner. Um, if, you, um, if you think about the presentations that we've seen um, this weekend, and if you look at the psychedelic literature, it seems to me that most of the work on psychedelics, a term, by the way, which I do not like, most of the work on psychedelics falls into one of two categories. There is the, the micro work, which means analysis of the effect of psychedelics on uh, cells and on the molecular level. And there is work that we can call phenomenological, which is on the macro level, which are studies on animal behavior or on personal reports by humans of their experiences having taken one psychedelic or another. There is very little out there to connect these two levels. And what I'm going to try to do in the time I have today is to make some suggestions about the ways in which cognitive psychology may be able to work to connect these two levels, or the ways in which concepts from cognitive psychology may help us understand a little bit better what it means to say that ayahuasca somehow causes hallucinations. Now, how many people here have drunk ayahuasca? Wow. How many people have had hallucinations while well, they have drunk ayahuasca? How many people have had hallucinations without drinking ayahuasca? Now, this may be the wrong crowd to ask this question, how many people have had hallucinations but were afraid to tell anybody about it because they were afraid they'd be considered crazy? All right. Um, let me tell you an experience I had and see if this matches your experience with having drunk ayahuasca and having had hallucinations um, with or without ayahuasca. I was drinking ayahuasca with a young corandero named Don Antonio Barrera, and I was feeling miserable. I was sick, I was nauseous, I was going at both ends, and nothing, nothing was happening. As a matter of fact, for the past several times I had been drinking ayahuasca, nothing much had happened except being really, really sick and seeing little flashes and seeing pretty patterns and seeing Greek key patterns and sort of whirling Van Gogh galaxies, but nothing that I felt talked to me. I did see Bugs Bunny. <laughs> Um, and I say that with some trepidation because, as you may know, Robert Crumb has confessed that when he was young, he found himself sexually aroused by Bugs Bunny. So I didn't want anybody drawing that connection, although we can talk about sex and ayahuasca if anybody's interested. I was sitting there with my head lowered, um, staring at the pan for vomit between my legs, and I felt somebody rubbing my head. And I said to myself, oh, isn't that nice? Don Antonio has gotten up and he's come over to me and he's rubbing my head. Isn't that sweet? And I looked up and there, standing in front of me, was a young woman, a girl, 16 years old maybe, an Amazonian girl beautiful brown skin, long, straight, black hair, wearing a white t-shirt and shorts. I can call up this picture anytime I want. And she had the most beautiful, radiant smile I had ever seen. And I looked up and she was bathed in light. 
And I, at that time, didn't think to wonder where this light was coming from because it was the middle of the night in a tambo in the jungle, um, and it was pitch dark. But there she was, bathed in light with this radiant, beautiful smile smiling down on me. And she was real. She was three-dimensional. She was interactive. She was, she was in explorable space. You know how when you, you close your eyes and you walk toward a wall, you'll stop? Because you can feel that slight change in air pressure as you approach a solid object? I felt that with her. She was as real as any of you are right now. And she was bestowing on me this beautiful, beautiful smile. And I blinked my eyes, and she was gone. That is an ayahuasca hallucination. Let me tell you one other, because this will be really important, I think, in the kind of cognitive psychology that we'll be talking about briefly. I was way out in the jungle in the tambo of a, of a corandero named Don Romulo Mahin. And I was there with him for a couple of weeks, living alone with him in his little hut out in the jungle. And his, his purpose was to give me as much ayahuasca as I could stand and sing the ikaros and the arcanas that would protect me as I drank the ayahuasca under, under his tutelage. And I was feeling really, really sick. And I went out in the jungle to relieve myself. I did not know at that time that I was, in fact, squatting over an anthill. <laughs> um, and it wasn't until the next day that I realized how pissed off these ants were at my squatting over them and doing what I was doing. But the important part of the story, aside from teaching me more humility in the face of the jungle, was that I looked down to my left, and there on the ground next to me was a Confederate flag. It was one of those little flags, one of those little plastic flags people wave at parades, and it was on the ground next to me. And just like my vision of the young ayahuasca maiden that I had seen, it was real. It was present. It was three-dimensional. It was as real as any little plastic flag could possibly be. And I said to myself, what is a little Confederate flag doing out in the jungle? So I reached over and touched it. And it immediately dissolved into its component parts. And what I saw was moonlight on the jungle floor light and shadow, bits and pieces of leaves and dirt on the jungle floor. And when I lifted my hand, it reassembled itself into a Confederate flag. Don Romulo had a cleared space in front of his, his hut in the jungle. And that's where I would drink ayahuasca. And I could tell when the ayahuasca was kicking in because the the grass would turn into a beautiful patterned Persian carpet. As, as many of you know, I am sure, um, um, the ayahuasca world is filled with tessellations, with tiles, with, with patterns. And these can even be projected onto people and things. So, I think it is true that ayahuasca is a hallucinogen under any definition of the term. The term hallucinogen was apparently first used in its current meaning back in 1832 by a French psychiatrist who defined a hallucination as the complete conviction of a sensation currently perceived where there is no corresponding external object within the range of the senses to excite the sensation. And that has remained basically the definition of a hallucination all the way through DSM 4 TR, and I predict it will be the same in DSM 5. Note that this definition of, hallucin of hallucination is naively metaphysical. 
that assumes that the absence of a perceptual object is unproblematic. It assumes that, that there is no perceptual object. So I think we can say that ayahuasca is a hallucinogen. When you drink ayahuasca, you can see animated, interactive, three-dimensional, solid, detailed, real things embedded in ordinary perceptual space. And let me add that it also means that you can have auditory hallucinations because European culture has, for several centuries, been fascinated by the visual. I think it's very easy to neglect the fact that ayahuasca is also a very potent auditory hallucination, a uh, hallucinogen. And it can, when you drink ayahuasca, you can have auditory experiences that are immediate, external, directional, locatable in space, and often coordinated with the visual experiences. I would like to propose that there are two concepts in contemporary cognitive psychology that may help us understand something about the way in which ayahuasca acts as a hallucinogen and may open the door for a broader view of visionary experiences generally. These two concepts are source monitoring and gap filling. In recent years, there's been something of a consensus among psychiatrists and neuropsychologists that auditory hallucinations occur when the individual misattributes what is going on inside with what is going on outside. That the speech that schizophrenics hear coming from outside is actually inner speech. And the process by which we distinguish between the internal and the external is called source monitoring. And we do this all the time. Let me give you a, a, a clear example. Have you ever had a dream that was so vivid and so real that when you wake up, when you woke up, you couldn't tell whether you were remembering a dream or you were remembering a real event. Who's had that experience? And then, which I, I, had an, I once had a dream where I had done a great injury to somebody I loved. And when I woke up, I was filled with remorse and anguish over what I had done. And it took a process of rational thought for me to recognize it must have been a dream because if it had been real, then I would not be in the relationship that I really was in with this person. It would have been unforgivable. Is that consonant with other people's experience? The process by which we make decisions about what is real and what is imaginary, if I may use those terms for a moment, is source monitoring. And it is a combination of um, rational decision-making, knowledge about how things work in the world, um, uh, working out your memories. Usually we don't have to work at it, but we can't make the assumption that we all do source monitoring in the same way. There is no reason to believe that babies are born with source monitoring already in place. There is good reason to believe that source monitoring is learned and that it can be culturally conditioned. So, um, the suggestion that source monitoring judgments are influenced by the inherent plausibility of perceived events can help explain how cultures, or perhaps shamanic training, can shift the line, the boundary, between hallucinatory and real experiences. And it works the other way, too. They did an experiment where people were asked to imagine a banana, but without their knowledge, projected on a screen in front of them was a barely visible 
picture of a banana. And it was clear that when the people reported their imagination of a banana, they were reporting on what they had seen on the screen. So that um, it's, it's important, I think, to think about the possibility that what ayahuasca does is to shift the line you draw based on your culture, your own personal experiences, your training, your experiences with ayahuasca as, as a, a trainee, as a shaman, in ways that are different from the ways that we do it normally. In other words, um, when I saw the Confederate flag on the ground next to me, I was in effect seeing something that was in my mind, but I was drawing a, the, I was doing source monitoring in a way differently than I usually would. And I was seeing it as out there. Again, I'm being naively metaphysical and we'll get back to that. Let's talk a little bit about gap filling. Um, here is the content of a series of visions. And listen, listen to this description. Golden sparks, melting purple blobs, a dancing brown spot, snowflakes, saffron and light blue waves, a corona of light like a chrysanthemum composed of thousands of radiating petals. Then as the vision solidified, there appeared a Cuban flag flying over bank building, an old lady with a gray umbrella walking through the side of a truck, a cat rolling across the street in a small striped barrel. Are those ayahuasca visions? Actually, they are what the writer James Thurber saw as he was going blind. Um, he had lost one of his eyes in a schoolboy accident when he was six years old, and as he grew older, he began to lose sight in the other eye. And as he was going blind, he reported the things that he saw, the visions that he saw. In his 1937 piece, The Admiral on the Wheel, he wrote of the spectacular things he saw despite the serious and growing deterioration of his vision. Bridges, he wrote, rising lazily in the air like balloons. A noble silent dog lying on the ledge above a brownstone house on Lower Fifth Avenue. A little old admiral in full dress uniform, his beard blowing in the wind and his hat set, he wrote, at a rakish angle. The um, neuroscientist Dilayanur Ramachandran has proposed that James Thurber was suffering from a condition called Charles Binet syndrome. Charles Binet syndrome happens often in elderly people who are undergoing macular degeneration and are, like James Thurber, going blind. And they report very, very similar kinds of hallucinations. They report um, uh, translucent figures floating in the hallway, dragons, people wearing flowers, people dressed in, in Victorian costumes, people dressed up like, like Royal Canadian Mounties. Um, and the important thing about Charles Binet syndrome is that there is no indication that there is any neurological impairment in any of these people. The only thing that is wrong with them is that they are going blind, and as a result of their blindness, they are seeing hallucinations that are very similar to the way we have described the hallucinations of ayahuasca. Um, Ramachandran talks about the process by which people who are going blind hallucinate. And he did this by studying scotomas, which are blind spots on the retina. You know, of course, that there is a blind spot on your retina where the retinal nerves enter 
the back of the eye. And you've probably all done this little experiment where there's a dot on a piece of paper, and you move it forward and back and around until the dot disappears because it's over the blind spot. Have people done that? Or am I, does everybody think I'm crazy? Okay. Look at the wall. See the pattern, the marble pattern on the wall? Move your eye around. Does anybody see a black spot? Does anybody see a place on the wall that corresponds to the place on your retina where there's no vision? What your brain does is to fill in the gap. And it does this even with patterned wallpaper. It does it with the pattern of the marble on this wall. Um, it does it even when there have been serious scotomas caused by physical trauma. And Ram Chandra has done a series of very clever experiments where, for example, he would do things like write numbers on the wall. Um, and he would write one, two, three, seven, eight, nine with a blank space in between. And he would have some of his patients who had diabetic scotomas look at the wall and the brain of these patients would try to fill in the missing numbers. One of the patients said this, um, one, two, three, um, seven, eight, nine. Hey, that's very strange, he said. I can see the numbers in the middle, but I can't read them. They look like numbers, but I don't know what they are. When asked if the numbers look blurred, he replied, no, they don't look blurred. They look kind of strange. I can't tell what they are, like hieroglyphics or something. In other words, our ability to construct our visual world is able even to construct missing numbers, although they are like letters in a dream. Have you ever tried to read something in a dream? You can't. You can read a couple of words, and then it just turns into nonsense. That's what the numbers were doing. Um, I think when I saw the Confederate flag, something very much like the same kind of gap filling was taking place. I was seeing the detritus on the floor, a jumble of leaves and twigs and moonlight, and ayahuasca was helping me fill those gaps. It was, in effect, searching my mind memory banks to find the closest matching image. I have no idea why it was a Confederate flag. I have no particular attachment to the Confederate flag. I have no particular interest in the Confederate flag, but there it was. Just as people with Charles Binet syndrome construct out of light and shadow and the dimming remainder of their vision, clear, present, three-dimensional hallucinations. Ramachandra talks about one patient who saw a monkey sitting on his lap then it seems to me that we can start to think about the way in which ayahuasca and other hallucinogens work by thinking about them in terms of their ability, one, to fill gaps, and two, to shift source monitoring so that the filled gaps appear externally to us. But I think what's important and where I want to end is this. Think about other experiences that are considered to be anomalous. Think about experiences like ayahuasca hallucinations that have been pathologized and marginalized in mainstream psychology. Think about a Dedic visualization. Anybody ever done any Tibetan visualization? Okay, exactly the same thing. You are creating a three-dimensional, present, interactive person in front of you. Out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, hallucinations like Charles Benet's and lucid dreams, um, false awakenings, waking dreams, apparitions, Apparitions, by the way, are very common in people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. People in a state of grief will frequently have hallucinations 
of their deceased loved one, but generally will not tell anybody about it because they're afraid they will be considered crazy. Jungian active imagination. Do people here know what Jungian active imagination is? Where, where you allow yourself to enter into this three-dimensional world and interact with other people in this world. Um, hypnagogic experiences, when you're just falling asleep and you see things or you hear voices. It seems to me that these experiences, which I will call visionary experiences, have several things in common. And they have these in common with ayahuasca. First, they occur with the force of a present perception of external reality. In ayahuasca, in lucid dreaming, in DMT experiences, in active imagination, what we have are present interactive objects and people that are as real as we are right now to each other. They have what appears to be the same quantity and quality of sensory detail as ordinary experience. They are experienced as external to the experiencer. They occur in what seems to the experiencer to be an extended three-dimensional explorable perceptual space. And they frequently involve interactions with apparently autonomous others whom we might call, I don't know, elves. I think that once we start looking at the fact that these kinds of experiences are very similar, and they are all fairly common, especially if you add them all together, I would guess that just about everybody has had at least one of these experiences, perhaps without knowing quite what it was and that we can start to see that certain kinds of cognitive psychological mechanisms may underlie all of these experiences, we can start to, start, we can start to take them seriously and start exploring them psychologically. But let me take off my cognitive psychology hat for a minute, because I think there is something very important going on here. Um, ayahuasca calls into question the source monitoring that we do every day. And the European tradition has taught us that everything in the universe can be put into one of two buckets, real and unreal. And everything there is goes into one of those two buckets. What ayahuasca teaches is that perhaps there are three buckets. There's real, there's unreal, and there are the experiences and the persons and the things we encounter in visionary experiences. Maybe there are more than three buckets. Maybe there are 20 buckets. Maybe there are no buckets at all. And I think what ayahuasca calls into question is the very act of source monitoring. When I used to go on vision fasts in the Southwest, and I used to help people go on vision fasts, one of the things we would do is after we had chosen the spot where we would stay, we would have a ceremony and people would go out to their spots and we would draw a line on the path. And we would step over that line and we would say, now we are in the realm of myth and dream and fairy tale where everything is meaningful, where the spirits are going to speak to us through signs and wonders and the merest stirrings of our heart are all messages from the spirits. I think what ayahuasca teaches when we think about it in terms of gap filling and source monitoring is that we don't need to draw that line in our path because right now, we are in the realm of myth and dream and fairy tale. Right now, this room is filled with the singing of the spirits. Right now, this room is covered with luminescent blue delicate tiles. 
Right now, the spirits are present because we have been drawing our lines in the wrong place. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, Steve, so much. Wow. What a sequence of speakers, huh? Okay. Who's got a question or a comment? Lots of them. That's good. I'd like to know how it is that you exclusively speak in terms of visual when your very first experience was kinesthetic, when that young woman put her hands on you. Mm -hmm. There's the whole spectrum of modalities, visual, I... auditory, kinesthetic, and a great many people in what is called hallucination mm -hmm. do synesthesias, tasting shapes, yes. smelling textures. This is more important to me than merely looking at what I saw. I think you're absolutely right, and I think your point is a very good one. I mentioned before that European culture has been obsessed with the visual, with the visual for hundreds of years. And ayahuasca, as well as other visionary experiences, can comprise sounds and kinesthesia. Ayahuasca is famed for producing synesthesia. Um, so I think your point is a very good one. If I concentrated on the visual to the exclusion of the other sensory modalities, it's because that's where the literature is. Uh, but I think your point is a very good one, and I think you're absolutely right. When I had my experience, I came to it without knowing what it was. I was given instructions with no information, um, no background information. And so I, the experience that I had was very different from the one that you're describing. I, I, it seemed that it was vibrational in nature more than mm -hmm. visual. That Well, it was extraordinarily visual, but... Mm -hmm. But I, but the experience of telepathy, mm -hmm. um, to be open, to allow oneself to be open, to maybe um, feel the integrated whole of everything, mm -hmm. um, was my experience. So I'm having, I had this guttural emotional response to your entire talk because um, it was so much more to me than that, and it wasn't. I didn't, I didn't see these other. Um, yeah, the source mongering that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I um, so well. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I, yeah, I just wanted your comments on that. Because no, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a very good point. And I, I think, first of all, um, everybody's different, and everybody's experiences are different. And I don't know who you drank with, but set and setting come into play as well as everything else. Um, if it was a, a mestizo shaman or somebody who had studied under mestizo shamans, often there are lots of different things in, in the drink that, that you're given. Um, sometimes they will put in thwe, which is a, 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 a plant in the brookmansia species, which is also hallucinogenic. So there is so much that determines what your experience is, and in no way did I want my recounting of my experience to be taken as in any way thinking that other experiences are less important. These are, these are my experiences, and it's on my experiences on which I, I base this analysis. I think what we need is a serious discussion of these different experiences so that we can start using the tools we have, both in terms of cognitive psychology and in terms of our view of the universe, to try to understand these. And as I've said, these kinds of experiences have been marginalized and pathologized by mainstream psychology for a long time, and it's only recently that people, uh, such as we've heard at this conference, have been taking them seriously. So I'm really happy that you brought that up. Do you think um, guides are or the shamanistic model in ayahuasca experiences? I mean, some, I don't feel super comfortable with giving up something to another person to lead the way for me. I mean, would you say that there's an alternate way to walk into that experience? I think if, I think there are lots of visionary experiences that people have. Um, who here is a lucid dreamer? Wow, I have never seen a whole room full of lucid dreamers before. 
Um, I, there, there are lots of ways in which you can um, break this boundary. Under the influence of Mircea Eliade, shamanism has often been described as a, a flight to the spirit world, a flight away from this world. Um, Michael Harner's core shamanism uh, begins, at least, it doesn't stay with, but it begins at least with the idea of the spirit journey to the other world, to the spirit world. What ayahuasca teaches is that I think the spirit world is right here, right now, and that um, there are other ways of breaking that, that boundary, and that include, you know, lucid dreaming, um, apparitions, you wake up and somebody is standing at the foot of your bed, um, where's my list? I made a list. <laughs> um, false awakenings, apparitions, active imagination, Tibetan ritual meditation. Um, these are all ways, I think, of breaking down our perhaps arbitrary source monitoring and opening ourselves up to the fact that this world is, is talking to us all the time. It's singing to us all the time. It's meaningful. Let me, can I just give an example? I, um, suppose that you are dreaming, and you have a dream that you're walking along a path, and you trip over a rock, and you look up, and there is a child holding a flower smiling at you. You're gonna spend a lot of time and effort saying, what does that mean? What does this symbolize? And there are lots of techniques you can use to find out what it means. For example, you can go back into the dream and you can talk to the rock and you can say, why did you trip me? What are you trying to teach me? Will you be my teacher? You can talk to the child. You can sit quietly and ask the child to come appear before you and you can ask the child, will you be my teacher? What are you trying to teach me in this dream? And we do that in a dream. But if we're walking down the street and we trip over a rock and we look up and there's a child with a flower smiling down at us, we say, hey, I was clumsy. We don't ask what it means. We don't pay reality the same respect that we pay to dreams. Suppose when we strip over a rock on the path, we turn to the rock and we say, what are you trying to teach me? Will you be my teacher? And maybe you can offer it some tobacco. And maybe in return, the rock will teach you a song. But we only do that in dreams. We don't do that in reality. And to me, that seems very disrespectful to reality. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> Uh, I just want to remark that the word hallucination uh, has carries this heavy weight. I'm sure you know that because uh, for like biomedic hegemonic discourse, these are illegitimate experiences. So I wonder if you if you don't think that you're you know by by using this word, it, it, it is a pathologizing word. From, from what it stands mm -hmm. today in Western culture. But that, that is minor because that is repetitive discussion. What I wanted to ask was... If you um, have a suggestion... I, I prefer to say visions. <laughs> it's very easy. I, um, visions. I was a vision. I, visionary experiences seems to me to avoid that stigma, but I am open. This is a purely arbitrary choice on my part. And if anybody has a better suggestion for what to call these things in a way that will make them even more acceptable to the academy, then I send me an email. <laughs> um, I just want to ask something. Um, because you said that ayahuasca maybe helps us not to make distinctions just between what is real and non-real, and it expands our comprehension. And I agree very much to that, and also this idea of source monitoring. But when you say in the part of your talk that it, it fills in the gap, like when you see this mm -hmm. flag, you make a, you kind of suggest a culturalist, constructivist explanation, mm -hmm. like a psychological explanation, that somewhere in your mind, mm -hmm. you had that image of, your, of this flag, and you saw that flag there because you constructed this gap. Right. So this explanation 
uh, is not breaking what you should suggested that should break, that is this real and unreal, because this is like a mm -hmm. cultural explanation, psychological. You're not really taking into account that could be something spiritual or other that is not psychological, that you are really seeing something that exists somewhere else, which is basically the indigenous narrative, that these things really exist, that you just don't see them normally. So All right. I, should, I should add that Bia and I are old friends, and we have been arguing like this for years. <laughs> but in this case, I think you're right. Um, I think that um, your point is a good one, but I think we have to follow a path. Uh, we have to follow a conceptual path to, to get to the end. Um, and I was kind of, I guess, retracing my own path. Um, what is, and one of the points that Ramachandran makes is that, in effect, we are hallucinating all the time, which fits in with what I've been saying. We are gap filling all the time. There is part of me that is behind this lectern, and yet there is nobody here who believes or who perceives me as floating from the waist up in space. Um, we are constant, as a matter of fact, it's amazing that we perceive anything at all. The image on the retina is upside down, largely black and white, mostly out of focus. Um, the eye is constantly moving like this. Um, so what we are constantly doing is constructing our reality in our brains. And I agree with you that um, it would make more sense not to use, when we get to the end, where, where we're talking about there being no line in the path, then that subverts what I said earlier. But I think that without what I said earlier, we wouldn't have gotten to the end. I don't know if that makes any sense, but Thank it's you. the best I can do. <laughs> Rob, you. Yes, this kind of follows up on what B was saying. In looking at this area of um, transcending or changing the um, the uh, the source monitoring, in terms of ayahuasca, it occurs to me that when we speak of ayahuasca, we are still speaking about something very definitive. We're talking about two very specific plants that engender a certain range of experience mm -hmm. for a certain period of time. So there's still this very definitive real world um, base to it. And so how do, you, um, how do you put that together with the idea that something different is happening? Um, something different, different in the sense of something that's, that's other than a, um, an alteration of the real world perception. I'm not sure I understand the question. I think, first of all, let me say that although in many traditions there are just two plants used, um, first of all, the, the vine is, is used universally, except where, wherever it is taken through the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, if people are insufflating uh, DMT containing plants, they, they generally, although there are exceptions, do not use the ayahuasca vine. Um, there are several DMT containing plants that can be used separately or mixed together among mestizo shamans along with the vine. There are occasions when people will drink the vine alone and report hallucinogenic effects. Um, so in addition, there are lots of things that are put into the drink among mestizo shamans. Certainly not in, in Santa Daime and UDV, but then we get into the whole marijuana question. Um, in, gen, in general, indigenous people will use just one plant, but mestizo shamans will mix in toe, they will mix in mapacho. But He's saying yes. that when you talk about an actual plant or substance that you can measure and you're taking it right. orally and it goes into your body, it's a physical process, and how do you, you know, um, integrate that with the abstraction is, of the spirits. And it, why, I have to ask you, why are there two things at all? Aren't there, isn't there really only one reality? And we kind of you know, leave out the spiritual stuff when we talk about the chemicals that are in the chemicals. And we leave out the material stuff when we talk about the spiritual, because spirit is embodied. I would, isn't there really only one thing? 
I'm not, I'm not sure that I, I think that when we're talking about the sacred plants, we're talking about merely physical things. I think that there are spirits to the plants. I think that there are spirits to the plants just like um, there are spirits to animals. There are spirits to trees and rocks and stars and thunder. I think that the universe that the shaman lives in is an animistic world in which things have spirits and the spirits are able to create effects. So when you drink ayahuasca, you are not simply drinking ayahuasca. But, you know, I have heard, for example, people claim that ayahuasca can cure all kinds of diseases. Ayahuasca can cure cancer. And people have made that claim. I don't see any evidence for it other than a few narratives. But to me, does that mean that all we think about ayahuasca is that it is a kind of green tamoxifen? That all we want from ayahuasca, that it be able to replace a vastin? I think there is much more to ayahuasca than that. I think there is in the sacred plants. And we're talking about all the sacred plants. We're talking about ayahuasca. We're talking about tobacco. We're talking about uh, doe. We're talking about peyote. We're talking about teonanakit. Um, we're talking about San Pedro. I think in all of the sacred plants, there are spirits. Now, I can't do that when I'm wearing my cognitive psychology hat. But I can talk about it when I take off my cognitive psychology hat. And when I'm talking with my cognitive psychology hat on, I'll talk about plants and constituents and physical objects. But deep down, I think there is a lot going on that's more than that. And whether that can eventually be captured um, by, by the kinds of tools that I've suggested we use today, I don't know. And on that, I don't know. <laughs> Um, let's thank Steve Beyer for... Thank you. Thank you, Steve.